as part of the youth ministry of a friend's church, every Friday night they would open their doors and invite the young people from the neighborhood to come. They would get together and play games, board games, activities, all kinds of things. And the goal was to provide a safe place for them so that they'd have alternatives to hanging out on the street. Well, one evening, uh, a man came and rang the doorbell of the church and said that he had come to pick up his daughters who were there. And when invited in, he said, oh, no, no, I, I can't go in there. Thinking it odd, the church member looked at him and said, well, why not? To which he then said, my life is a mess, and I know God doesn't want me in his house. And the member looked at this father with great compassion and said, well, actually, you are just the person Jesus came for. That church member expressed a Jesus welcome. In, in so many ways, people have heard or been taught or made to feel or simply assumed that they are not welcomed by God. Maybe because they have done things that were wrong or maybe things that they can't even forgive, let alone believe that God can. Maybe they have made a mess of their lives, made poor decisions or bad choices, maybe hurt or harmed people. Or maybe because they are this or they are that or they're not this or they're not that, the, the list can go on and on. Sometimes this leads people to self-police themselves, as this father did, and, and kind of keep themselves away from the church. And other times, those spoken or unspoken messages become true as people become gatekeepers at the, at the church, to demanding and saying who is welcome and who is not. But the truth is, the truth is, with Jesus, all are welcome, both sinners and saints. And when I, we hear this story in, of Saul being called by Jesus in the book of Acts chapter 9, we realize that that is exactly what happened. Jesus welcomed Saul. Now, if there was anyone worthy or deserving of being rejected or cast away, it was Saul. Saul who destroyed churches. Saul who persecuted Christians. Saul who set entire communities fleeing for their lives. Saul who even condoned murder of Christians. And yet, it is Jesus who comes after Saul. Jesus is the one who has seen and known Saul, even while Saul is planning on doing what he's doing. Jesus is the one who has, pl has a plan for Saul's life, even while Saul has a plan to persecute the church. Jesus is the one who goes to Saul and says, why are you, conf why are you persecuting me? You remember, Jesus said, whatever we have done to the least among us, we have done to him. Jesus is the one who gave Saul a spiritual time out when he struck him blind so that he could meditate on the truth of who the Messiah really was in him. And Jesus is the one who set Saul free. After three days and later sent him on a mission with a new purpose, to preach the good news of Christ and become the one who would lift up Jesus rather than condemn them all. Over and over again in the story of Saul, we see Jesus being the one who is welcoming 
Saul of all people. And there's a movie on Netflix called Jesus Revolution. I don't know if any of you have seen it yet. It's a true story of a spiritual revival that swept through the US in the 1970s, primarily among hippies of that day. And there's a wonderful scene in the movie where one of the leaders of the church is absolutely disgusted. He's disgusted because his church is filling up with all of those hippies and he doesn't think they belong there. And what's even worse is they're coming to church barefoot and dirtying up the carpet. And how dare they do this to this holy and sacred place. And so he turns to the minister demanding that he do something about this. To which the minister says he will. And so the following Sunday for worship, when they get to the church, there is a long line of hippies, all barefoot, and they're standing on line, waiting to come into the church, and there is the minister at the door. And right in front of him is a chair. And he invites each hippie to come and have a seat in the chair as he then bends over to wash and dry their feet so that they will be able to enter this holy, sacred sanctuary clean. That was a Jesus welcome. Sometimes there is this false impression that people have to earn God's love or be better than who they are, or fit into a particular mold or shape, or act like this, or be like that, in order to be loved or wanted by God. But the Lord already knows all about us, knows our names and our stories, knows every hair on our heads, knows the questions and the doubts that we are sometimes too afraid to acknowledge, let alone articulate, knows the anger and resentments that burn within us, and knows the loves that brings us great joy and makes our hearts sing. We are not invisible to God. We are not rejected by Christ. Jesus knows and loves us and says to all of us, come, for we are welcome just as we are. And in coming, the beautiful thing is that in coming, we are changed in Christ. For those of you who've been on this journey with the Lord for a long time, can you raise your hand with me and say, I'm changed. I'm not the way I was before. We see this miraculous change that happens in Saul. I mean, in Saul's case, it was a miracle. <laughs> Made a complete 180 degree turn overnight. Not even overnight, in a second. <laughs> A change so astounding that even the church had a hard time believing it. Christ works on our hearts, changing them from stone to flesh, and works on our minds, renewing us so that in him we might go out into the world to live and be more Christ-like among those whom we are called to, to be with. And we're all works in progress. None of us have arrived. I know I have, and there's still stuff that God is working on me with. We all are works in progress. This morning we were reading, Pastor Duane and I, um, from a, this wonderful book. What is it called? Grace Notes, Grace Notes by Philip Yancey. And he made this, this note. He says, we are all God's works of art. And when I thought about that, I said, yeah, God is still doing a little painting on me still. And I think that's true for all of us. 
But even though sometimes we may want to dictate what that change should look like in everyone else, ultimately, it is not our job. Because by the power of the Holy Spirit, it is the Lord who does a new thing in all of our lives. And it's all for God's purpose and God's great pleasure. Many years ago, I started a, um, a 26 week, 26 weeks discipleship group. And it required a lot of commitment. But there were four people who said, yes, I'll, I'll be a part of it. And so we got together every week for 26 weeks. One of the persons in our group was a deeply spiritual person who loved the Lord greatly. And she was also very timid in her faith and extremely afraid of expressing it. Didn't want, you know, as far as she was concerned, her faith was private, it was to her, and she didn't want to be a part of anything that required saying anything out loud, doing anything out loud. So I was actually thrilled when she agreed to be a part of the group because that was part of what we were going to do. We were going to come together as a group to talk out loud and share with each other about our faith on a weekly basis. But she said yes. Well, after meeting for a few months, I happened to be in conversation with her. And to my great amazement, had learned that she had started to do her homework for the class in the local public library. She would go there every week a couple of hours and sit at the table and she'd have her Bible and her workbook and her journal and it's all there out in the open for the whole library to see. And she said, she said laughingly, she says, that must have been a sight. <laughs> but she didn't see the mind and I said to myself quietly, Oh, the change is happening. <laughs> and then, months after our class had ended, in my former church, we used to, during the community prayer, we were a small congregation, and so we used to get up and form a circle in the sanctuary during the community prayer. And different people would offer a part of their prayer or, or say something or whatever. And, and she never, ever said a word. But this one Sunday, this one Sunday, we were all together in a prayer circle. And, and she spontaneously offers this most beautiful prayer of thanksgiving in front of the whole church. And I almost let out a whoop in the middle of her prayer. <laughs> if no one knew how far she had come, I did. And I praise God because of it. Jesus welcomed her, even with her shy, timid faith. And in him, she was growing by leaps and bounds. I could end here. But I want to highlight just one more thing. One more thing about Jesus and his welcome of us. Because it's not only about what he has done for us, you know, this, this vertical relationship that we have with Jesus. It's also about what he has empowered us to do for each other loving each other, the horizontal part of the commandment. When we read the story of Saul becoming a follower of Jesus, we realize that Jesus not only welcomed Saul, Jesus also had to work with the church to prepare them to be welcoming people who would offer others a Jesus welcome. In our scripture lesson, in addition to going to Saul, Jesus also went to Ananias. And he went to Ananias to have him go and place his hands, touch and greet Saul. 
And even though Ananias had reservations, I'm sure he had all kinds of fears within him. Even though he had reservations, rather than succumb to the fears and the trepidation that was alive within him, Ananias obeyed Christ and went to Saul. And he became a vessel of both healing, but also a vessel of welcome that set Saul on a path towards being one of the greatest evangelists of the church. What a welcome that was. It was such a big deal that when Saul came to the church in Jerusalem, the story tells us, the scripture says, that Barnabas even was moved by it. And Barnabas went to the very people who wanted to reject Saul and said, no, this is real. We need to welcome him. My beloved friends, what a difference our welcome can make. Maybe sometimes we don't think it's a big deal. You know, we welcome our friends, we welcome people we know. But what a difference welcome can make. May it be contagious and life-giving. And may the love of Christ be experienced in us, that we know that we know that we know we are welcomed by the Lord. But may it also be experienced through us as we share what we have received from, from Christ, a welcome that lets us know that we are loved, that we are wanted, that we are needed by our Savior, who calls us one of his own. Amen? Amen. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we thank you, Lord. The hymn says, just as I am without one plea, we come. We thank you, O oh God, for welcoming us, for calling us, for putting this tiny seeds of must, this mustard seed of faith within us, this yearning to know you more, we are so very grateful, O oh Lord, for all that you do in our lives. And we pray, O oh God, that more and more you help us to, to share that Jesus welcome with everyone that we meet so that they too know that they are wanted and loved and known by you. We ask this in the precious name of your Son, our Savior. Amen.